<sighs> All right. Well, thanks for clarifying that, Gary. I appreciate it. Oh, hey, uh, just one more question. Um, what do you think about the, I guess you could say the, the conditioning of, of people? I mean, even in the, even some guys I've met in the Patriot community, I mean, don't you think there's something odd going on there? Well, I don't know if there's anything odd, but, uh, you know, we talked the other day briefly about conditioning and, I see that there's conditioning. Well, you, you, you've you used the phrase predictive programming a number of times, and conditioning, I think, is a little bit different. They're, they're similar. They uh, end up with a, basically the same goal, which is a change in the way we look at things, I guess is the best way to put it. But uh, predictive programming is something that is kind of, projecting the future. A good example would be in 1910, I think it was Aldrich uh, was the one that submitted a bill to Congress uh, that had the Federal Reserve. Basically, it was the Federal Reserve Act, but I think it was called the Aldrich Bill or something like that back then. So it came out in 1910. And oh, people were upset over it, and they uh, uh, resented it, and some some parts of it were objectionable. And so three years later, it comes back under the Federal Reserve Act uh, as the title, and the the very objectionable ones are taken out uh, to be reinstituted later on down the road. But the the idea of a, uh, a national bank that was privately owned that could issue its own currency without specie behind it. Uh, had been laid out and talked for three years about how good it is for the economy. So that was predictive programming. They put, threw something out there. They got people used to the idea, and then they took out the objections and then passed the bill. Now, we saw the same thing back in the early 90s with uh, North American Free Trade Agreement, NAFTA. Um, I remember I was up in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and Ron Engelman, who had, uh, was got me, helped me get the power of attorney in Waco uh, asked me to come on the radio show uh, that he was doing in Albuquerque, uh, and I, I think we were talking about Waco kind of, an, you know, two years later to thing on Waco, a year and a half later on Waco, but when he started the show, he started talking about NAFTA, and he was going through his, his list and saying, well, this is okay, but I don't like this, and this, man, this, this one's really bad. And so he was doing the same thing. He was subjecting himself to predictive programming because this bill was thrown out there. Uh, it was trashed in public. Uh, the, the people in Congress got a sense of what was acceptable and what wasn't. And by the time they appeased enough people, they got a consensus and got NAFTA passed, and the objectionable parts eventually came back in. So that's predictive programming. But let's look at conditioning. Uh, it's a little bit different. It's... Um, but, it, again, it has the same purpose to change the way we think about things. And I think the first thing that I became aware of in predictive programming was probably back in the uh, 70s or 80s, and it was a program called Cops on television. And I remember the first one I saw, these plain coat clothes cops in Miami, Florida, were in pursuit of a guy. And uh, the guy apparently uh, made them, and he started – driving away from them, and so this cop takes out the uh, bubblegum machine and puts it on the roof of the car and turns the light on so there's a blast, flashing blue light, and they did have a siren in the car, and you could hear the siren going. And the cop makes a statement uh, when when people, not seeing a cop car, say got in a left turn lane and these guys had to go around them, the cop made a statement, these, and the beep, idiots, don't they know we're cops? Can't they get out of our way? Something like that. And now this is conditioning because by playing this, people say, well, damn, even if they got a bubble gum machine and they're not in a police car, I guess we got to get out of their way. So this is reality uh, being thrown out to us. And then we accept the premise that what they can do is right. Uh, another one I saw a few years later had to do with prostitution in Las Vegas. Now, uh, in Las Vegas, prostitution, I think it's the only county uh, in, in the state that doesn't allow prostitution. The entire county, uh, there's no prostitution allowed. And 
I remember, you know, I hate to say from my drug days, but knowing drug people back then, uh, the common question if you met somebody new was, are you in any way connected with any law enforcement agency? And if they answered no, uh, you could assume that they could not testify against you. I mean, this is honesty, that you, you had a right to know. But these cops, two cops in a car, and they pick up this girl and hook her, and one's in the back seat with her, and she says, are you uh, – in any way connected with any law enforcement agency. She says, oh, no, not me. And then they bust her at once she takes the money for whatever she was going to do in the backseat of the car with the one guy. So that world changed, and the the uh, conditioning came as a consequence of this being shown on television in prime time, you know, for kids to watch and everything. Uh, so if you want to change the relationship that exists, you just, use the television to set a stage that uh, allows you to present something that would otherwise be illegal, make it legal, and now we've conditioned people to accept that. So whether we pass it statutorily or not doesn't really matter because people accept that we can, the cops can do that. They can be obnoxious towards people and call them names because they won't get out of their way because there's no police car. Uh, they've gotten away from the integrity that used to exist in law enforcement where they had to be honest and tell you if they were law enforcement. Um, and then seeing a proliferation of programs on television. Cops was the first one that I know of. But we have all these other ones. I mean, Bad, bad boys and all these other ones, these cops are doing things that when I was a kid, they were illegal. Cops did not do them. There used to be a requirement to fire a warning shot before they fired a shot at anybody. They used to not shoot unless they were directly threatened. And now they blow people like Diallo away with 86 well-placed bullets. And uh, they, they pull things like Waco. I mean... It, the world's changed. Now, this is conditioning, though, because in Waco was a big part of conditioning. Now, the government hasn't tried it again because I think they had such a balancing act on it. But uh, to presume that they could come in with basically a military encirclement of the Mount Carmel Center, the church, not the compound, and uh, play military and, and detain these people and deny the right of contract. They had paid for their electricity and their phone, and their electricity and their phone were cut off. They had absolute control of these people. And that became, to agree, acceptable. Now, we haven't seen something on the, side, uh, the, the, the scope of Waco, but we do know that in other situations, they'll cut phone and they'll cut everything else. But the Constitution says the state shall not impair the right to contract. And if the state can't impair the right to contract, how can they void a contract that I have when I'm paying for my electricity or telephone? So this conditioning is a very subtle process that has the same effect of uh, predictive programming, but is using real life instead of uh, a suggestion to, to create the premise that these uh, objectives are desirable or acceptable. Interesting. Okay, so I, I guess from... What you're trying to tell me then is that conditioning is more like real world practice as opposed to predictive programming, which is just a a, a, a hypothesized or fictionalized uh, role playing. Yeah, and like I say, they're the same effect, but they're different. One's planned out uh, and presented and evaluated and tested and thrown around, tossed around. And then they look at what is possible as a consequence of what they have thrown out, the bone they've thrown out. And then they uh, pursue that course. They, they create the acceptability before the fact, where conditioning is more like creating the acceptability after the fact. Um, another form of conditioning that I found out about years ago, and they've perfected it, um, when I was in the military, the day room had a pool hall. It might have had a couple of pinball machines television, radio, writing paper, chess, checkers, things like that. Um, 
I guess it'd be probably in the 80s, a friend of mine got out of his, <laughs> he got kicked out of the Army because he drank. Oh, boy, see, that's a change, too. Nobody got kicked out of the Army for drinking when I was in, but uh, and everybody drank almost. But he said the day room had these, um, the more realistic, the video type games in it, uh, like Doom. And Doom was a favorite. And I guess probably all the day rooms had it. Now, Doom, if you've ever played it, has blood splatter and machine guns and he's just killing. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm familiar more with, uh, the, the, the ones that came after. But yes, the tradition of the, FPS is the first person shooters are to uh, <laughs> uh, try to make, uh, I mean, uh, there's no other way of putting it. It's supposed to de- desensitize you to violence. And it does. And, and that's, that's what it is. Too. Now, Army went even further. Uh, I had downloaded the game, but it was, uh, I think, I'm back on Windows 98, and I, the Army gave it out. It was a game that taught you Army stuff. Uh, you ended up on a rifle range, and you had to shoot so well, you took classes and worked your way up. Um, I never went all the way through, but there were so many steps that somewhere they had to get uh, past the normal train fire uh, and uh, record fire uh, type scenarios. And my guess is, and from what I've heard from other people, uh, what they did with this now is got even more realistic. You're not shooting Nazis in this big building. You're shooting enemy soldiers from a distance, close up. Uh, I don't know if they got artillery into it or not. But, again, now they're doing a realistic programming. So you put a turban on a guy's head, darken his skin a little bit, put him in a robe instead of a uniform, and uh, then you start, then you teach these guys to start shooting these guys, seeing the blood spread or hearing the sounds of, of death, uh, seeing the scenes of death in a very realistic setting, much more the people on the portion of the game that I saw are very realistic looking. Uh, so they well, yeah. So they're going, you know, far beyond Doom. Uh, they're going into conditioning people uh, by letting them run through a reality, a role-playing game, basically, or FPS as you call it, first-person shooter. Um, and, and it's, I think, more conditioning. Uh, because it's not throwing something out to be chewed up. It's actually treating it like real life and is conditioning these guys. Now, what makes me think that uh, this is conditioning? Um, on the web page, I don't know if you ever saw it, but on, on my Murder American Style page, um, this injured uh, Iraqi is laying on the ground writhing. You know, he's in pain from a wound he's uh, received. And there's a guy that you hear a shot, and you see dust fly down by this guy. And I think about the third or fourth shot, it hits the guy, and the guy goes still. And afterwards, they are interviewing this guy, and he said, that was awesome. I killed that motherfucker. Uh, this is the consequence of that role-playing, uh, that, that conditioning that went on on those machines in the day room of the, the Army, uh, you know, the the company quarter the company quarters in the army um when i was in vietnam i don't know anybody that was as, as ecstatic as this guy and this guy didn't f- kill an enemy that was shooting at him he killed an enemy that was disabled now we were taught if you have any opportunity to take a prisoner he might have information we can use so we want him alive because his brain might have something in it where he might not have papers on him you know it was important if we didn't risk your safety uh, to, to get, take prisoners. And I think this has been true in the military for quite some time. But in this case in Iraq, they didn't want, he didn't want to take a prisoner. He wanted the blood splatter. He wanted the kill. And then if you look at some of these YouTube videos on snipers, how ecstatic they get when they get the, the pink cloud, I think they call it. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's pretty typical, yeah. So this, uh, and I, I can... I can imagine why these come back, guys come back with uh, scrambled emotions because they have been conditioned to enjoy taking human life. Uh, Vietnam, there were guys that went over the edge, you might say, but never to the point that I've seen in what I've, I've been describing, the, uh, the ecstatic uh, nature of killing a wounded man or 
getting a, a, a pink cloud at, uh, uh, you know, 3,000 yards or something, whatever distances they're shooting at. Um, and But that's the consequence of conditioning, and the Army realized somewhere along the line of the benefit of conditioning, this type of conditioning. So they've conditioned these people to be, uh, let's be blunt, to be murderers. Uh, to shoot an injured soldier is murder because, let's just say, Black Hawk Down, they killed an American pilot. We're outraged mm-hmm. they killed the guy. They should have taken him prisoner. But we've got this double right. standard. It's only American soldiers that can't be abused. We can abuse theirs. We can murder theirs. We can do whatever we want to theirs. But they've got to respect us. What? Well, it kind of reminds me of something that uh, J.B. Campbell said, where, you know, the Army and the Marines are trained to kill on demand. You know, kill, 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 as one ashamed veteran, you know, told him. And so, I mean, and also, you know, just look at uh, how they uh, treat the uh, prisoners at Abu Ghraib or in Guantanamo or any of these other places. I mean, they're quite, I mean, they're sadistic. They are. Now, Kill, kill, kill is different. In Vietnam, we were taught to kill, kill, kill. If the enemy was there, uh, we would kill them as long as they posed a threat. Uh, so kill, kill, kill is still there. That's the job of the soldier. What's the old saying? Uh, to kill people and break things? Uh, that's, the mil- yeah, the military is designed to kill people and break things. <laughs> but the point that morality should step in and keep you from doing things that I consider despicable. Uh, and I don't know how you feel about it, but I, I can think it's despicable uh, to keep trying to, to kill an injured man. Um, I don't like the, the concept of uh, sniper that we use and selective assassination, which we use, especially with the drones. But in the case of bin Laden, it was a directed assassination. Um, the British were mad at us for taking out the officers. That made sense when the officers were leading the troops. And when the officer went down, the troops had no leadership, and they didn't know what to do next. But we've gone well beyond that. We used to be the moral high ground to some degree. And, you know, that's degenerated over time. And the military has used, learned to take advantage of conditioning. So the kill, kill, kill now is not kill the enemy, kill, kill, kill. It's kill with glee, kill, kill, kill. So the, yeah, the, that kind of psycho- psychopathic enjoyment, I think, is what you're saying is the difference. Yeah, the, the difference between the two is very distinct, even though the end result is the same. Well, not the same, because a lot of people would live under the first premise, but on the second one, kill, 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 gleefully. Uh, <laughs> hey, women, children, who cares? Unless it happens to Americans, of course. So, well, I mean, there was the old joke about, like, one American is worth, like, 500, you know, brown people in the sands of some far-off land or something to that effect. Some, you know, people have made different versions on a theme of that joke about the ratios. Uh, again, is conditioning. that uh, That's the mentality that's being bred into the modern soldier. And then the modern soldier, look at how he's protected. He's... <laughs> more protected than the knights of old were against a, a stick or a staff. I mean, he's got body armor. He's got groin protection. He's got Kevlar. He's got a face shield. Uh, he's got radio. He's got instant communication without making hardly a sound uh, audible from, you know, 20 or 30 feet away. Uh, he is, uh, he reminds me of some old science fiction movies. In fact, he reminds me a little bit of some of the things in Star Wars. You know, he has become so, bodily ar- body armored that it's uh it becomes cumbersome yeah stormtroopers yeah the stormtroopers the guys in white is that the the ones well in star wars anyway but if i correct me if i'm wrong but i believe the same term is also applied to uh some of the germans in the 30s and 40s i mean i don't know maybe maybe george lucas drew upon that i i don't quite know the the history of that but at least in the star wars fictional series yeah and isn't that interesting too? Uh, not to not to get too divert on predictive programming, but you know, there's that whole issue of the about the galactic empire controlling the entire galaxy, and then you have you know the you know the rebellion, which is really just the what they call the old republic. You know, so there's that, that whole kind of <laughs> those little aspects in there. So 
And, uh, you know, I mean, the stormtroopers throughout the movie are, you know, kicking down uh, people's stuff. I mean, they killed Luke's foster parents. They burned, you know, it, it was almost kind of like a home invasion in some ways. <laughs> you mentioned the, uh, Hitler and the Germans, though. They weren't heavily armored individually, were they? I'm not aware of not, that. Not that I'm aware of. I mean, the closest thing I be, think was the, the style of their helmets. But generally speaking, I thought they pretty much, uh, even different types of units, always wore uniforms. I don't think they had, you know, level three body armor back then and knee pads. I don't, I don't think they had stuff like that. Then, <laughs> um, you know, it, I just recently on the blog put up that uh, Tahoe Regional Area Plan Trap article that was written by Maureen Heaton in Bellingham, Washington. Um, back before 93, I published it in the first edition of the Outpost of Freedom newspaper. And she had sent me another article. And, you know, sometimes things aren't intentional, but they have a consequence, too. And uh, she sent me an article uh, to publish, and I chose not to. And she talked about Walt Disney and Bambi and teaching people that, that uh, the humans are mean and to have sympathy for the am- animals. And I started thinking about that and said, no, I'm not going to r- run this article. You know, is it entertainment for kids or is there really a motive behind this? Now, I have a lot of respect for Walt Disney. Um, you know, he had a dishonorable discharge, but uh, his purpose was to entertain children. And it could be that uh, I doubt that he had the motivation to create that effect, begin a conditioning process uh, sympathy to animals, screw the humans. But if we follow that, and I look back at that article, maybe you had to find it, dust it off, and, and, and publish it now. Marine's dead, but uh, was that the beginning of the green movement? <laughs> you know, humans are bad, the animals are good. But look what we've got now, and look at what uh, Disney under Eisner is doing with a lot of things, Lion King and all these. Uh, humans are bad guys. Um, you know, these themes that are rolling out now um, are far beyond Bambi. Bambi was entertaining, and I never saw it as green until I began putting in perspective to what's happening now. But now that would probably come under the predictive programming side. Yes, 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 it would. I mean, I guess the closest thing to where it would be or a better example of where it would be actual conditioning is a lot of the, uh, well, I mean, just hell. I mean, let's just use, uh, you know, where I live in Austin. You know, I mean, it, I mean, Austin, Texas is known, uh, has, a, has a lot of different uh, varying reputations, but one of them is that it is the home of a lot of eco-fascists. I mean, there are people around here, locals, who unfortunately do things like go up to bigger cars, usually SUVs, and they key it. What that means is that they you know, take the key and they cross it, you know, diagonally across the window or the actual uh, part of the door or whatever uh, as a way of um, yeah. it's really a matter of intimidation and uh, and that sort of thing. And then, of course, there's the, uh, you know, city government where, you know, they all push all sorts of green, ag- you know, green agendas and that sort of thing. If you come out and find your car keyed or are you just pissed off, it's not intimidating. It's. It's kind of like what the government did in Waco when they trashed all the cars in the school bus. It's just uh, childish behavior. It's not intimidating. I'm not intimidated if my car gets keyed. I'm pissed off. But they're playing children. They're just destroying something because they can. It might be jealousy. I don't know what it is, but I wouldn't call it intimidation. I would think that that word has to come out of that discussion. Well, at the very least, they're they're trying to express their displeasure, and then on the other hand, you have the more uh, to their friends. <laughs> well, yeah, but don't they also? Uh, I'm trying to think of what got there in a BMW. Well, I mean, don't I mean? Wouldn't uh, some of those uh, status type environmentalists think that it's progress for uh, uh, for for different governments to basically you know try and push for? Uh, whatever they think is the newest environmental fad. It's to drink water out of a plastic bottle. Those ones, those environmentalists. <laughs> I guess probably. I think there's so much hypocrisy and uh, childishness in a lot of that movement. I think some people are s- sincere, uh, 
but you know the videos I've watched on it, uh, you know, for the most part, probably eighty percent are sincere, and the rest are breaking windows, keying cars. But they're just doing it to show off, to impress their friends. Um, I think one that you and I both watched. Uh, once a guy came out of a store and confronted a guy, the guy backed down real quick. There was no intimidation. And he didn't key this guy's car. The guy just said, that guy's being destructive. I'm going to go out. I think maybe it was a broken window. But I'm going to go out and talk to that guy. And he went out and talked to that guy. And the guy backed down quickly. And his friends were all looking on as he backed away from this guy that came out to confront him. So I think they're showing off. Uh, I don't think there's any rational motivation for what they do when they key somebody's car, when they don't know whose car it is. They have no idea. It could be some guy that has worked his ass off and always wanted a nice car and finally saved his money and got a used nice car, a, turn, a trade-in, and uh, is proud of it. Now, this guy's suffering because of this guy's attitude? That's not right. If he knew whose car it was and could point the finger at that guy, it would make sense. But he's not thinking. He's an asshole when he keeps yeah. it. And it's funny you should say that. I mean, I mean, they don't think. I mean, that's the thing. I mean, it's just random, well, almost random, just like overly emotive stuff. I mean, and, and their assumptions are completely faulty. I mean, in a lot of ways, they're not even consistent with the, uh, the ends they claim to want to manifest either. I, I mean, that's the really scary part. Well, King Cars is what ex-girlfriends do to ex-boyfriends when they realize <laughs> looking than the old girlfriend was. If you think about it, yeah, it's more of a it's more of a revenge tactic, yeah, childish behavior, well, of course. But the environmental movement did it come from Disney? Uh, you know, is it possible? You know, it, it could be. You know, things change over time, but when it becomes intentional and it's masterminded, that's when it's really conditioning or predictive programming. And I don't think Disney was doing predictive uh, programming or or uh, anything back in the, I guess, the 50s when Bam, I think it was the 50s when Bambi came out. He was just trying to entertain children. You know, those that weren't around back then on, on Disney every week on television, Walt would talk to the people, and you get, understood what his philosophy was. His whole life was devoted to making children happy. He had a train set up in his backyard in his house, and he invited all the neighborhoods, it's, uh, I guess, about two, a foot and a half tall or something, and it ran around the track, and he would invite the neighborhood kids over to let them ride on the train. His objective was to uh, make children happy. And so I don't see any predictive programming on him, but uh, I'm sure that you could probably do some research and find out that predictive programming and conditioning uh, theories existed a long time ago. Isn't Pavlov's dog a, uh, a conditioning process? Yeah, it is. But it's been perfected more recently to have a, a, the effect of social engineering and political engineering in the case of, you know, things that go on in Washington. So its purpose now is, is really a social engineering aspect to bring subjugation on us without us being aware of it. You know, look, don't look at the left hand, look at the right hand. A good example is, is that what you showed me earlier about that, uh, blog you did on that uh, SWAT raid in Aguila, Arizona. Oh, yeah, that. And somebody came back on that and said, well, the drug dealers, they should have done that. Well, they didn't think that out because 85 miles with two big SWAT trucks and ambulance and all these SUVs and 20, 30 people, uh, why didn't they stake out the house with two people and do it? But we're getting the, the person that responded, Lynn, whoever that is, the response to that was a demonstration of her having been conditioned by this concept that the police have to go in with complete protection, uh, wheel a little old lady out in the rain for a drug bust when they should have known if the guy was in the house or not. But they went in as if he was in. If they'd staked out the building like they used to, the you know, the hard work, they would have known if he was in the building or not. Well, that's officer safety for you, ain't it? Well, look, uh, <laughs> for Colorado, the theater shooting, I got a kick out of that. The officers assembled outside till they had a sufficient force and the necessary equipment 
for, to provide for officer safety before they entered the theater. In the meantime, people are getting shot and killed. That meant, yeah, they're just a bunch of cowards. Well, the government, you know, <laughs> public servants, uh, the cops, used to realize that their job was to prote- to serve and protect. Now, what is protecting? Who are they protecting? Uh, serve and protect the officers or serve and protect the public? All my life in L.A., all the cars said serve and protect, L.A. area. And... I always thought they meant the public, and I've become to realize after what happened in Aurora, Colorado, is to serve and protect the police officers. Screw the public. They don't matter. We'll get the sympathy from the, the, the people because mainstream media is on our side, and they'll help us condition the public to accept the premise that we had to go wait until uh, officer safety was assured before we entered the theater to try and stop the shooting. Now, true, the shooting was probably over, and the guy... Uh, had taken his, uh, what did he, he went back, I don't remember what he did, but at any rate, the shooting may have been over by the time uh, they got there, but my guess is uh, that there were officers available long before the shooting was over. But for officer safety, they can't go in, and we accept the premise now that it's officer safety, not the public safety, but they call them public safety departments that the police come under in most cities. Oh, well, um, it is rather confusing, isn't it? Yeah, well, I, I think it suffers from a lot of deceit. Uh, you know, probably a, an easy entity to look at would be the, I, I guess it's still called mainstream media. I guess it's mainstream. I don't know. Their, their viewership uh, on the cable channels has been going down for many years and, not many people are reading their uh, crappy newspapers, so I don't know if it's really mainstream. But for sake of argument, to keep it simple, let's call it mainstream. You know, mainstream media, I mean, their whole deal uh, is basically to act as the high priests uh, for the government. I mean, they're the apologists. I mean, that's they don't really do anything else, really, at the end of the day. You know, everything's fine. The establishment will take care of you. You know, the corporatists are here to, you know, have their oligopolies to circumvent the free market. But then we'll call it a mixed market or mixed economy and we'll trick everybody. But then they get favors from the government. Then nobody knows, you know, how economics works. This is too confusing. Or just, you know, when it comes to certain governmental actions. I mean, uh, <laughs> I mean, you've, you've mentioned before about your uh, experiences trying to get into the uh, press conference at Waco. You know, same thing with Lewis Bean. I mean, it's just, I mean, that's that's their deal is to uh, present a version of events that becomes an official story, regardless of whether it's real or not. Sometimes it is and sometimes it isn't, I guess. So, and, uh, you know, that's it. I can the press conferences in Waco because I'd gone for a while and then I did something that they didn't like and mainstream media didn't pick up on it. But that's when I wasn't allowed to go back in. Now, Lewis Beam was just kicked out. He was in, but he was kicked out. <laughs> uh, well, let me explain the two. Lewis Beam had asked a question at the press conference, and that question was something like, is what's happening here in Waco indicative of the coming police state? Well, there were a few motions made up on the stage. Nobody answered Lewis Beam's. The Waco Police Department, a couple officers went over to Lewis uh, Beam with their hands on their guns and escorted him out of the building never to return. Which means, basically, if they had sh- mainstream media had shown what had happened, the people watching would have known that the police state was, in fact, removing Lewis Beam from the press conference. But since it's primarily audio, unless you're there, uh, most people didn't realize that the question was asked. It was probably edited out. Um, but the answer, we got the answer because when he was removed, basically at gunpoint, we knew that it was indicative of the coming police state. Yeah. And I mean, even the removal of Lewis Bean, I mean, that was something that actually happened. And so that would tend to reinforce kind of, I don't know if it's necessarily Pavlovian, but it's definitely a conditioning type of, uh, you know, action there. Like, look, if you are like this guy, Mr. Bean, and you ask a rather pointed and important question about something, the thugs in blue uniforms will remove you. Mm -hmm. 
So that t- so that reinforces to everybody else there, you better fucking stay in line. Well, let's you know, don't go, question the system. Let's go back to another question you had about mainstream media. Um, mainstream, side streams. Mainstream is the one that flows into the river. It's the one that's got a lot of water going out. Side streams come in, and, and a lot of times backwater keeps the side stream from even flowing into the mainstream. Mainstream media owns the primary distribution network of information. They've got all the bucks behind them. They control what goes on. The uh, the syndicates behind them control what programming goes on their mainstream, uh, CBS, CNN, NBC, MSNBC now. Is ABC still around? Yeah, I guess they are. And all, all these. So they are mainstream because they control the primary channel for transportation of, of news. Now, the Internet hasn't even come close uh, to achieving the kind of results that mainstream media can get. Uh, it's moving in that direction, but was, look what's happening. You look at the alternate press and look at some of the stories you get on that. Are they a consequence of conditioning? Um, have many patriots been conditioned to believe that any time anything goes wrong, the government's behind it? Or let's call them false flags. Everything's a false flag, right? Oh, God, not this again. Yeah, I, I, I know what you're uh, getting at. Oh, dear God. So, <laughs> sites are backwatered by this tendency to make the government responsible for anything. Uh, even though a lot of times, Adam Kokesh is an example, where he's actually setting it up to be videoed being arrested at the Jefferson Memorial or Lincoln Memorial, wherever it was he got arrested. Um, Jefferson. But, but <laughs> there's a manipulation on our side. Now, the question is, is what is this conditioning that's going on within the uh, patriot community that, that leads us to believe that everything's a, a false flag uh, and the government's behind it? Um, the Newtown. Let's take Newtown. Uh, this, I've been watching for years as, as the stories grow. Back in Waco days, it was weeks before somebody suggested that David Koresh had been working for the government as an agent and they were smuggling drugs and there was a methamphetamine lab and all this story. The meth lab, David kicked out of there when he kicked this other guy out. Uh, but these stories started coming and they picked up momentum. Now, one that carried a lot of momentum, which was very disconcerting, was the famous flame throwing tank. And, uh, well, it was false. But everybody bought it because of little editing of some footage that was available of this tank pushing a hole into the front of the building. Now, we get to Oklahoma City bombing, and it took less time for it to be uh, because they were looking for John Doe 2 and John Doe 3 and John Doe 4 and all these other people. Um, they've got to follow all these leads, and so they put things out to try and find information, but everybody takes this as truth. And mainstream media, during the course of the uh, getting the bodies out, uh, getting people out of the uh, raw building, the press would, uh, because everybody cleared the area because somebody saw something they thought was a bomb, mainstream media saying they found another bomb. Statement of fact. Now, mainstream media, those are the ones that always lie to the patriot community unless they say something that supports this condition process of false flag. Oh, geez. So... All of a sudden, everybody's accepting, yeah, there were three bombs they found, because the press, you can see it on CNN, that uh, they found another bomb, they found another bomb, they found another bomb. And this goes on and on. So we're being subjected to a conditioning process by mainstream media that we don't believe unless they say what we want to hear. And then they're the most truthful people in the world. But the things out of raw building took a while to build momentum. Same thing with September 11th, 9-11. That took a while for all the speculation to go against. Uh, one guy even told me, well, I'm not going to say it, but other people uh, said that there were no planes flowing into those buildings, and I'm not going to say that I disagree with them. 
you know, his, his subtle way of not making an ass of himself, even though he did make an ass of himself. Um, but this, you know, that took a while to build steam. But we go to Newtown, and man, this started the same day. But let's look at what happened. I was watching the, uh, CNN that day. I kept, uh, you know, getting these news flashes on the Internet, and i go read them. And when I, uh, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, i go, uh, i turn the news on. And I, th- I think I counted 17 different stories. One was about uh, the brother who was arrested because CNN pointed the finger at him. He was actually arrested because of CNN. But they had 17 different stories that first day. And this is, in Newtown, this conditioning process of false flag, government did it. Some people say no children died. Nobody died at Newtown. Others say that, well, one of the premises is a girl in a a blonde-haired little girl in a red and black dress was sitting in Obama's lap two days after the the shooting, and she... Oh, no, that. Um... (laughs) It's crazy, but you know they've whoever's behind feeding this garbage to the patriot community, and it's getting picked up then by the guess what I know mentality people. You have a different word for them. Uh, you call them useful idiots. I I just say they they their egos. They want to be important, so they say guess what I know. So somebody feeds them this garbage, and they say guess what I know, and they start passing it on. So this is a conditioning process. We've been conditioned to grab this stuff and perpetuate this false flag philosophy when there's no nothing of substance behind all the garbage they're putting out. You know, I looked at all the pictures that was the, the, the guy in uh, uh, Colorado's attorney is supposed to be one of the teachers, uh, except she looked a bit older than the teacher did. Um, but, no, oh, that doesn't matter. She had brunette hair. And she wasn't bad looking, so that's enough to, to lock these two together and, and say they're the same person. It's an actor or, or, or an attorney or an actor or, or an attorney. What would an attorney doing, be doing acting in, in Newtown? Uh, what would an actor be doing representing a client in court? I'm, I'm not. <laughs> I think there's some obvious disparity in, in the presentation of this garbage, but people see it, they pick it up. They believe it, and they pass it on, and now we've got thousands or tens of thousands of uh, emails and web pages and everything talking about how this whole Sandy Hook thing is a hoax. Don't forget the videos up on YouTube. I mean, there's been a plethora of it. Yeah, you know, but- even if I'm trying to watch something, on, uh, watch something on a completely different subject, usually I've been noticing, especially as of late, in the related video sidebar, which is, you know, uh, part of how YouTube works, there's... At least within the past two weeks, there's always at least one Sandy Hook thing. Even if I'm watching something completely unrelated, like cooking or something, it's nuts. Well, it is, and I think I, I pointed one out to you, uh, and i got to give you the whole story on that. that to, earlier today, uh, somebody on Facebook posted one that uh, is a, a, takes you to a YouTube video, and this guy, he's got a big screen behind him, and it'll, you know he's standing in front of the screen showing this footage of a news conference, there's two camera angles. One uh, gets all three people in, and one gets two people in. The one that gets two people in, you see a mailbox that appears behind the lady who's in the center, but then when they go to the three-screen shot, you don't, or three-person shot, you don't see the mailbox anymore. And the guy says, this has got to be fake because there's a, the mailbox disappears. Um, he doesn't have a good sense of camera or uh, camera focal lengths and how they work or perspective, because if you look closely, you see the guy on the right's chair points outside the mailbox. And so when it goes to the three-person shot, what's directly behind the guy is blocked out by the guy that's sitting there, and the mailbox isn't that tall either. So I pointed that out, and so the person who'd post- posted on Facebook looked at it and agreed with me. And a little while later, hmm. somebody else says, this is a green sh- screen shot. You can look at this, and I didn't even look at uh, Oh, no. Uh, but they're claiming uh, green screen now in it. And uh, so the person that posted it initially now has jumped back on the bandwagon about it's green screen. And then subsequently, the same person that had posted this stuff that I saw posted a new post on Facebook 
that says, you patriots, you got to see this, especially the last hour. And the title of it is, uh, just a second, I'll tell you. It's right here on Facebook. And uh, it's kind of phenomenal. Yeah, it's like... <laughs> the documentary, Prins, full video in Prins, 2013 official. Official? What makes it official? My God, Patriots, stop posting and look what's going on. Arm yourselves with knowledge. Watch this. <laughs> At least the last hour. That's the lead into it. Oh, dear God, no. Official. Oh, I don't There's... <laughs> There's a word for the verb side list. Yeah, I get this point. Might as well. You see, this is this is the kind of the problem that I'm, I'm having, Gary. Is that yeah, this person? What diff? This person stepped down earlier when I pointed out the camera angles and all that, and she understood it. And then she comes back and does a new post. And I'm not even going to watch the video. Apparently, it's at least an hour long because you're supposed to at least the last hour. Uh, Who's making these videos, and what's their purpose? What's the motivation behind the people that make these videos that try and um, gather large groups of people and turn them into opposition against those that want to know the truth but won't believe anything that's thrown in front of their face? Now, is the government behind this? Because they seem to, with Newtown, have mastered the technique of creating division immediately after the event. Oh, that's a good point. Well, I mean, I just, I don't know how else to describe it, Gary. I mean, at this point, all I'm thinking is that what difference does it make? I mean, sure. Um, uh, <laughs> that's the problem every time this, the, the, this retarded notion of false flag ops goes is because at the end of the day, what's really making a difference is the implementation of the Hegelian dialectic. So everyone arguing and bitching with each other over step one, which is the actual event itself. See, that's the part that a lot of people kind of overlook who claim that they're truthers or, or whatever other similar label, is that step one, the problem, the event itself, can either be an artificially contrived event, such as but not limited to a false flag, or it can be a genuinely occurring event. But at the end of the day, you're still going to have step two, the reaction, and step three being the establishment's quote-unquote solution to it. So, again, why all the focus on – see, here's probably the penultimate question. I mean, why all the focus on Sandy Hook being real or Sandy Hook being a false flag op? I mean, at the end of the day, the government's pushing for more gun control measures, which that's kind of the issue, isn't it? Well, it is, and let's just suppose somebody that watched it, Sandy Hook, the documentary, full video, 2013 official version, was called to a, uh, went, went to a, a town hall meeting or was called to a hearing somewhere in a, uh, or went to a hearing in a, a city or a county or a state or the Congress and went in, in, in opposition to gun control legislation said that started spouting off this bullshit. Their credibility is gone. As a consequence of Sandy Hook and back to the Hegelian dialect, an event happened. Uh, to me, it happened. It, like many others, some nut that should have been in a, a state hospital is instead on, on some psychotropic drug on the street. He has access to weapons through his mother. He gets off his drugs, and he goes and starts killing people. How many times have we seen that? Too many. This is something that can occur without being a false flag. I mean, do we really think this guy's been uh, taken over by MK Ultra or the uh, uh, CIA agent or something, a foreign power or something? Or did he just... I've seen no proof. ...go off and do something stupid? Now, once he's done it, the, the government's going to... They're going to pull out these gun control legislation that they had written years ago and have tried to foist on us before, but it's been rejected because the public attitude wouldn't allow it. Um, they pull it out once again to try it again. These people that are chasing ghosts on what happened in Newtown, if they were concentrating more on realistically opposing gun control, they would be far more effective. So this diversion back to the conspiracy, 
the Sandy Hook hoax, um, wasting their energy on that, have taken themselves back to divide and conquer, have taken themselves away from being effective in resistance to gun control. Yeah, they sound like they suffer from the McVeigh syndrome. Yeah. Uh, it's just, but not every suspiciously violent event is a false flag. I mean, literally what you've been describing are essentially un- suffer from both overgeneralization as well as the sin of misplaced emphasis. Literally what they're doing is in step one of the problem of the action still. And there, it's almost as if it's an excuse to focus, like, obsessively on that instead of brainstorming how to deal with step three about, you know, the establishment solution, like you said. I mean, it's a lot like an excuse for inaction at the end of the day. And I think that's what really ticks me off more than anything else. Kind of reminds me of a few things that have happened, you know, especially a decade ago, if you know what I mean. Uh, it's a lot like that. Well, yeah. And so who's behind it? Now, it's not follow the money in this case. Uh, and the, the whole thing on the Sandy Hook hoax is they're saying that this was perpetrated so that they could foist the gun control on it. But I'm not sure that there's merit to that. You know, I'd, uh, But these people that follow the hoax idea actually give merit to that. So that what they've done is... Uh, where an event occurred, they make such a mockery of that event that they lose credibility with the people that might otherwise support opposition of gun control because if these guys are claiming I have guns and Sandy Hooks is a hoax, is that going to scare a responsible gun owner even or somebody that believes you should have gun ownership if you're responsible begin to think that all the people that have guns are kooks? I mean, there's a lot of things on here that just yeah 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 it would it would make it would make them look like that yeah and I and I I don't know Gary I I keep thinking about what Bur- in fact I I think I've got uh, something I think I was rereading some of his stuff and uh, literally what he mentioned was that I want to get this right. Uh, the conscious and intelligent manipulation of the organized habits and opinions of the masses is an important element in democratic society. Those who manipulate this unseen mechanism of society constitute invisible government, which is the true ruling power of our country. We are governed, our minds molded, he has suggested, largely by men we have never heard of. This is the logical result of the way in which our democratic society is organized. Vast numbers of human beings must cooperate in this manner if they are to live together their society. So that right there, he's he's basically postulating that uh, you know everybody's getting manipulated, and at this point, I don't see why those in the patriot community, even if they're well intentioned, would be immune from that. Well, maybe we ought to give them, especially two. if they're not uh, really thinking about this. Maybe we ought to give them two scarlet letters: I am, not for instant message, but for ignore me. <laughs> yeah, I think you're uh, onto something with that. Well, hey, thanks for uh, uh, explaining that to me. I, I really do appreciate it. It's something that's been weighing on my mind as, as of lately. So um, I, I guess I'm. Uh, I guess my concerns were valid as far as the conditioning goes. No, I think they <laughs> definitely are. And, and between the two. Predictive programming and conditioning, the two different methodologies, uh, they can achieve that end. All right. Well, hey, thanks again, Gary. I appreciate it. Okay, Sleepy. Bye.